Good afternoon. I am so thrilled to be able to come here and to speak to you as a genealogist and as one who is interested in history. I am not from this area. I was born in Kentucky, uh, raised partially in West Virginia, moved to Ohio, and finally ended up in Port Clinton, where I hope to stay. My interview is on Marie Wannell or Wannell. I went over to Lakeside yesterday and took pictures of her home, and I'm going to pass it out to you. Just take a look and see what a beautiful home it is. This interview was taken by Sharon Mitchell, the 21st of February, 1986. I was born at Upland, Indiana, June 4th, 1910. My father, Brackney, was on the faculty at Taylor University. I had two brothers, Herman and Edward. My oldest brother, Herman, had been injured in birth, and as he became school age, there was no special school available. So dad decided to give up his position at the university and return to the family farm near Wapakoneta, Ohio, where he could teach in a one-room school and take Herman along. When I was six, I had the experience of attending the same little country school. Half of the students were my cousins. Our family got along well together. There was love and understanding among us. We attended the Little Methodist Church, which had been founded by my father's ancestors. My father's parents were pioneer settlers there, purchasing their land in the former Pawnee Reservation when the Indians moved westward. My mother was born in Norway. She came to America at the age of seven. Her father was an architect. They had lived in many towns and cities, and she had no knowledge of farm life. Father's family loved her dearly, and they took great interest in teaching her how to be a farm wife. Financially, farming was a disaster, and in 1922, Dad decided to return to teaching. This was the year of my first visit to Lakeside. We had come to Port Clinton to visit my uncle, Arthur Kirk, and his family. It was a great thrill to me even to be able to see Lake Erie. The area around here fascinated me. Uncle Arthur took us on the famous ride around the Horn, and we saw the lighthouse and a number of memorable sights. <coughs> when we came to Lakeside and went to the dock, the arrow was just docking. It was a beautiful day with blue sky, big waves, and I will never forget that sight. The following year, the summer of 1923, I was invited to spend a week here with Ruth and Edith Knight. That happened to be the summer they were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Lakeside. Jane Knight helped plan different activities for us girls, something different each day. One day, we took the interurban car to Bay Point to go swimming at the sand beach there. We hiked to the lighthouse and was taken up in the tower by Mr. Cap Hunter. He was a very imaginative person and he liked to show the lighthouse to young people because he could tell the yarns just as big as he wanted to. We were very gullible, and that was quite an experience. <coughs> Each day, we'd go down to Central Park where preparations were underway for the big historical pageant. We and about 15 other teenage girls were given pastel-colored cheesecloth dresses to wear with wide flowing sleeves that were tied to our wrists so that we could raise our arms, and then we looked like we had angel wings. We were supposed to glide gracefully across the stage at a proper signal. The pageant began with the first residents, which were the Indians. Then they had the coming of the early settlers. Then the first circuit rider came in on horseback. That was Reverend Sidney Mayer, who was the local pastor. It happened that he was the grandson of one of the very early circuit riders in this area. So he was cast in the right spot. We girls were supposed to stay in hiding under the foundation of the old bell tower, but we wanted to see the pageant. We kept coming up at the wrong time, and they shooed us back. Anyway, this pageant was quite an experience. The week at Lakeside passed all too quickly, but the following year, 
My dad was hired to teach in the high school there. We moved to Lakeside. To me, that was a dream come true. I was a sophomore in high school at the time, and the new school up on the hill was just being opened for the first time. We used to walk to school and meet our friends on the way. The first time that we went to church at the old brick church, the whole family walked in together. There was a bunch of boys standing there by the front steps, and John saw me. Later, I saw him at church, and I asked Ruth Knight about him. She says, ah, he's too young for you. Actually, he wasn't. We are the same age. But he seemed younger because he had missed a year of school and I had gained a year of school. So I was a sophomore when he was in the eighth grade. That didn't make any difference. We enjoyed the church activities, particularly the Epworth League. Sidney Mayer was just out of college and this was his first pastorate. His wife Dorothy was quite a favorite of ours too. At the Epworth League parties, she was the most fun of all. In the fall of 1927, I went to Cleveland to the Cleveland Teachers College. It's now a part of Western Reserve, but at that time it was run by the Cleveland Board of Education. I was trained for elementary education. The next year, I felt I could not depend on my parents' help anymore. So I took the teacher's examination and got a temporary certificate. I got a job teaching at Gypsum. I taught there for two years and lived at the home of my uncle, Arthur Kirk. This is the same Arthur Kirk who, at the turn of the century, was a partner in the brick store. When Lakeside had run into financial difficulty and went into the hands of a receiver, he was the receiver. After two years of teaching, I decided I should have more training. I went to Bowling Green for a year. After that, I got a job teaching first grade at Delta, Ohio. Each year, I came back here for the summer. John and I started dating when we were about 15 years old. Just very casual dates, going swimming, and to the auditorium together. Neither of us really cared about anybody else. So when we were 19, we became engaged. But until 1933, we just financially could not think of being married. That year, we had postponed it so many times, we decided, now or never. In the meantime, the church has burned and there was no church to be married in. So we arranged with the Brathwaite family to be married in the sunken garden in the back of their house. One of the Lutheran groups had the custom of serving a Galilean breakfast early in the morning with the people gathered on the lake shore. The minister spoke from a rowboat which was anchored just offshore. Then they served loaves and fishes. By this time, it was no miracle. Before daylight, my mother started frying fish fillets, keeping them hot in big roasters in the oven. The Port Clinton Bakery had baked rye rolls in the form of little rolls. Mother had made gallons of hot coffee, which they hauled to the shore in big lard cans. We like to work with these groups because they were so appreciative. Now, my dear friends, I want to tell you how I feel about family history and reading such things as this. It's wonderful because it takes you back to years that we don't know much about. But a few years ago, my dad wrote his personal history he died in March of this year, and this little personal history has become so precious to us as a family. I'm not going to keep you long, but I want you to re I want to hear just one little excerpt that makes me appreciate my dad so much. And he was always telling us to be frugal and to do this and to do that. Of course, we didn't listen, but now that we have this little history, we do understand. He says. Finally, I made my, back into, my way back into the New River Country, into the Kanawha River Country, and I went over to the river on a ferry boat and bummed my way across the river on that ferry. I told the owner I didn't have any money and promised to send it to him when I got a hold of some. 
I also told him that I hadn't had much to eat the last three days, and he bid me get on the boat. I was cold and hungry, but I got across and started up the river bank. I found a dime melted in the ice, and I picked it up and took it to the boat owner, and I offered it to him for my fare, but he wouldn't take it. Then he told me to take it to a little store up the road and buy myself a dime's worth of cheese and crackers. They sure tasted good, just like they were sent from heaven. <laughs> the interview was done in June 20. 9th, 2001, by Nancy Dunham with Wilbur F. Wistinghausen. <laughs> Memoirs of Memoirs Farming Near Oak Harbor. And this is especially meaningful to me after I read it because I grew up for a short period of time with my grandparents on a farm near Marion, Ohio. And it was before electricity was there and, and the farming the old fashioned way. And so a lot of the things that Wilbur speaks of, I experienced and watched as a, as a young boy. My great-grandfather, Yapsi Wistenhausen, came to America in 1856 from Prussia. He and his wife settled in the Cleveland area. One of their sons was Frederick. Frederick and Mary Catherine Schwartz were the parents of my father, William. They were married in 1861 and moved to a farm on Lutz Road, just east of Oak Harbor, in 1865. I remember when I was a small boy, my father took me down the road, just across the railroad track on the right-hand side, pointed to a log house and said, that's where I was born. He went on to say that it wasn't very warm in that house, especially in the wintertime. They would wake up in the morning and have to brush snow off the blankets before they got out of bed. Because the land was part of the black swamp, my dad put drain tile in the entire 80 acres. It was almost impossible to grow a good crop without drainage. In the early 1900s, they were putting drain lines in 670 feet apart. Nowadays, they're putting drain lines in 35 or 40 feet apart. Well, they ran into a bigger main, which runs into a big ditch, which in this case runs back to my house. The water ends up in Lake Erie. About 1924, my dad bought a Fordson tractor. There were very few tractors in the area, and dad bought one of the first tractors in the community. Henry Ford built it, and when his son came in, it was in honor of his son Edsel. Today, it's just plain Ford. He bought that tractor, and it was really something. Before that, we plowed for, with horses. We'd plow, and it'd be hot. We'd have to rest the horses. Sometimes we'd take the horses over under a tree in the shade to rest them, because it was not only was it hard work for the horses, but they needed to rest. But the tractor plowed two furrows. It didn't need to rest. After the Forson tractor, he got into a McCormick Deering. They were called farm alls at the time, farm alls. A lot of them only had one or two wheels in the front real close together, and the back ones were at a normal spacing apart. There were spaces that you could cultivate corn with them. In those days, the corn rows were pretty far apart, and you could go down the rows and cultivate corn. They don't cultivate corn anymore, but they did in those days. Originally, we cut the grain, wheat, barley, oats, by a binder. The binder would cut the grain and put it into a bundle. The bundle was probably 18, 20 inches in diameter, and you would have to pick up those up, and then you'd have to put them in a shot, probably two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve 10, 12 bundles. Stand them on end, and then put one on top to keep the weather off the grain. It was a lot of work, hot work, always always in July. After a certain time, two, three, four, five weeks, the grain would be cured, dried, no shocks. And then we would put them on a big hay racks and haul them into the barn. 
and put it in a mow, and there it would lay until winter. Come winter time, a thrashing rig would come in, and then we would thrash it. In other words, we would separate the grain from the straw, and we'd always build a straw stack. It would be out in back of the barn. It would blow the straw into a stack, and, and you'd have a straw stack. And that's the way it was done then. The neighbors would come in, three, four, five, with their hay racks. They would go out into the fields and have one man pitching the bundles up into the wagon, another man in the wagon placing them around in an orderly fashion so that they would not fall off. And you'd make a big high load. You'd haul that up to the thrashing machine. Then again, you'd have sort of a get, to get set up outside, blow the straw back on the barn into a stack, so that, it was thrashing out, so that was thrashing out in the field. You probably had a dozen people in the farms you were thrashing at, and they'd have to furnish the meals. Sometimes we'd get supper and sometimes we wouldn't, but we always had a noontime meal. We'd come in tired and hungry and dirty, and they had a wash tub out in the yard, and everybody washed in the wash tub. Some of the farmers made homebrew beer and would treat the help at noontime. That time, my dad bought a thrashing outfit, which means a separator. The separator includes a machine that separates the grain from the straw with a big tractor to run the separator. He bought a McCormick Daring outfit from the Hablitzel Brothers Hardware. Now, my sister, Naomi, was bookkeeper there at the time. To do that, to complete the operation, you'd go from farm to farm and thrash the farmer's grain. And to do that, we had to have something to haul our gasoline and oil, and so we needed some conveyance. So Dad had a 1915 Studebaker touring car. That was his first car. <laughs> he bought that about 1915, around the time I was born. He must have been excited about my being born and thought, oh boy, we'll buy a new car. <laughs> By 1924, that was getting old, so he traded the Studebaker in for, for a Chevrolet sedan. Of course, the Studebaker and Chevrolet were what we called stick shift on the floor. You push the clutch down and you'd stop. Now the Model T Dad bought operated differently. When you push down on the pedals, you'd go. <laughs> the gear shift, you push on the pedals, you stop. Well, Dad could not learn to drive that thing. He went through several gates. <laughs> He'd drive up to the gate, want to stop, and open the gate. Instead of stopping, he went right through the gate and broke down the gate down. Well, he did a few of those. And he said, I can't learn to drive that. But you know, I was nine years old. I could drive it, so I drove the Model T. <laughs> so I had to go along with him thrashing to, to drive the Model T. He bought that Model T touring car. He took the back seat out of the Model T and built a box in its place. And we had what you call a, today a pickup. It was a neat outfit, no top of course. So Dad and I went thrashing. I was the engineer then, and that was my job. Dad was up on the separator, tending to the blower to put the straw out on the straw stack. He had to move that around to make the straw go evenly and periodically to raise it up because the stack kept getting higher. So he did that for years, four or five probably. Thrashing operated depended on the weather. <laughs> it rained a lot. You had a problem. You had to wait until it dried. Well, this run season, it rained a lot. It kept raining and raining and raining, and occasionally it'd get to a day when it was dry enough to thrash. Then all the farmers would come over and say, Dad, can you come over and thrash my grain today? Well, there was no way you could do that. You had to do it in an orderly fashion. We would go down the road from farm to farm and do the thrashing. Well, they kept begging him and getting on him and finally couldn't take it anymore, mentally. And, and so he, he bought another thrashing rig, another separator and another big tractor. That was a Red Rover separator and a Lawson tractor. We, we had two machines, so Dad hired another man who was real good. The time the season was over, we had people's grain pretty well thrashed and everybody was happy. Now we had two thrashing rigs and a lot of money invested. The way the farmers paid, I think, was five cents a bushel for wheat, four cents for barley, and three cents for oats. 
during the Depression, some of the farmers couldn't afford to pay their bill. So we just said, okay, just let it go. When World War II came along, my name came up to be drafted, and I was, and I got a six months deferment. And finally, in October of 1943, no more deferments. And I had to report to the draft. In December of 1944, we loaded our equipment, guns, trucks, and everything on a train, flat cars, and we got to, in the passenger train and headed for the East Coast. Ended up at Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. We were there a couple of days, and when we got on the ship, and we were headed for, for Europe, for England. We got about halfway over, and then we made sort of a, a right-hand jog, and we were headed for France because the Battle of the Bulge was going on at the time, and somebody thought that they were going to need some help. So instead of us taking us to England to train some more, they took us right to France. By the time we got to France, the Battle of the Bulge was over. I got to tell you one more thing about the ship going over. We had to do some guard duty on the ship, especially at night. And I remember I would be up on the upper deck of the ship, be standing against the bulkhead. And it's dark. I mean, it's, it's, it's really dark. There's not a light in sight. That was the reason we were there. Uh, if you saw a light, you reported. Because we didn't want any lights going. You get to standing there a couple of hours and you get to thinking about a lot of things. You get to thinking about that you're all kind of all alone. Here you are out in the big ocean, can't see a thing, and you get kind of a lonely feeling. Then comes morning, the sun comes out, and you look around, and all you see is ships, just like yours. You're in a convoy. As far as you can see, there are ships. You can see there are ships, probably 25 or 50 of them in the convoy. Now, we didn't have any guns on our ship. But on the perimeter of the convoy are all battleships. And they all got big guns. They're all out there in case you're being attacked by the Germans and they're going to protect you. But you get an entirely different feeling from what you had that night before. You're not all alone out there. All you can see are people just like you. And it's a good feeling. rather daunting knowing you were here. <laughs> I'm certainly glad they're here. My daughter Beth and her husband Rick over there. Uh, okay, thank you. You look so different. Grandfather John Heidel was in the peach business over here on the island, so they had a lot of acreage there. It was all full of peaches. <laughs> Time went by, they eventually went into the grape business, and when they passed away, well, then my father, he, <laughs> he was one of the first bootleggers. <laughs> well, you know, we lived right on the edge of the water, and it was very profitable for him. Why, I can remember him making brandy just like it was yesterday. Well, those peach orchards were gone by the time he went into the brandy business down in the old cow barn. I mean, he went into the bootleg business, but he used to buy peaches from Catawba. That's when the old Erie Isle was running back and forth. I, he'd go around to all the farmers and he'd buy up all the peaches that fell to the ground. He'd buy up the entire crop and then he'd use them to make his peach brandy. <laughs> he had brandy stashed all over the place. He brought, bought property right next to where they were living on the lake. And next to that was an old vineyard going to pot and it was a good place to hide things, you know people too because those prohibitioners those revenue people when they'd come over on the boats why they were never on the ferry unless everybody knew about it you know it was a very close-knit community 
<laughs> well, I don't know how we did it, but we had three or four German people living with us during those years, people by the name of Wolschke. They could barely speak English, but he had them working in the vineyard and <laughs> helping us. And I can remember, just like it was yesterday, if there was a surprise raid, we couldn't get to them for something. I remember my dad telling those people, you gather up all those bottles you can find, and you go hide, and you hide those bottles, and if anybody catches you, you go back to Germany. <laughs> remember it like it was yesterday. Well, with them and several others, my dad would haul stuff up to Detroit. First wine, and, and then in prohibition business, well, then he'd take the hard stuff with him. I remember a Ford truck he had, just like it was yesterday. Well, everyone referred to my father as Uncle Roy. Too bad he succumbed to the evils of alcohol himself. <laughs> he was quite a guy, I'll tell you. Got a lot of pictures of him and my mother. My mother, she wasn't so happy though. She, she could never quite fit into that life that he made. My dad, he bought her a house on the airport road when they got married. That's where he used to store some of the stuff, down in the basement, you know. I remember my father sitting on the stairway reading a newspaper, guarding it. <laughs> but the people over here were all nice. I, everyone, you know, it was close-knit community. Well, there was Kurt Wojski, of course. During the war, he was followed by the FBI people over here all the time checking on the German people. They were trying to scare them away, you know. And, but my dad, he went into partnership with a man from Detroit by the name of Wolf. He was a Nazi. My dad found that out. And I can remember going with my parents to a Bund meeting. That's a place where German people gather. Well, I was 11 years old when I started to work for my father. I believe he was telling me things he did at his age, and when he was my age, he expected me to do the same kinds of things. Well, I watched my dad make illegal liquor. In fact, we had a lane, and I remember when he was in the process, I'd be at the end of the lane, and if anyone showed up, I would alert him. We'd use hard coal during the day when he was processing the brandy because its burn was smoke-free and then, then soft coal at night when you could see the smoke. Just little things like that. Little things I remember about growing up. Uh, of course, when Prohibition ended, he made arrangements to buy the Shul house. Made a tavern out of it. <laughs> I remember he and Jim Polis and the Heidel brothers bought it. Of course, they served only beer and wine at the time. As so beautifully articulated by Hermione Gingold in The Music Man, I am reticent? Yes, I am reticent. And I'm reticent because I'm the only one that's being forced to read their own material. <laughs> And I want you to know that I consider that a very special form of purgatory. <laughs> this interview was given February 20, 2002 to Sally Williams, and I thought at the time it was given under the sacred seal of confession. <laughs> but it wasn't. Life in Port Clinton. My father was of an old line English colonial stock and not only claimed to be, but was in fact a descendant of William Brewster who came uh, on the Mayflower. My mother, on the other hand, was a lovely lady, but a very hard-nosed Southern German Roman Catholic. And she always used to say to Dad, well, you think your folks came on the Mayflower, but I know mine came on a cattle boat from Schleswig-Holstein. <laughs> now there's an internal inconsistency there because Schleswig-Holstein's up near Denmark mm -hmm. and the folks came from near Switzerland. But they, now I want to talk about my recollections of Port Clinton. I was born at what was called the Pool Hospital. There was a hospital on the north side of 3rd Street between Jefferson and Madison, right next to the tracks. That was the private hospital of Dr. Poole. 
So I was born in Port Clinton, although most of my contemporaries were born in Memorial Hospital in Fremont or Good Sam in Sandusky. But I was born at Poole Hospital. Interestingly, Dr. Poole was a one-armed surgeon. He'd lost one arm, I don't know how, and I'm told there are still manifestations in this community <laughs> of immediate postnatal one-arm surgery. <laughs> I went to school through the public school system, even though my mother was Catholic. My father had been president of the school board from 1939 through 1962, and he always said he didn't believe in segregation. So the two boys went through the public system, although my sister went to the Catholic school. Growing up around town and going to school, we always walked to school. There was no such thing as being driven to school. We rode our bicycles when the weather was good, but our home, an old Kelly home on Fulton Street, was about a quarter of a block from the lake. So we walked all the way from the lake, essentially, to the school campus, which was directly south of the courthouse, what is now the middle school, and before that, the high school. Interestingly, the Lake <coughs> Erie Southern Interurban Railway ran right down the middle of 4th Street. At that time, there was still passenger service between Toledo and Cleveland, but it was primarily a freight run, and they were hauling crushed stones from the quarry in one direction and coal in the other direction. You had to time your trip to school so that you didn't get stopped by the interurban, because these things were miles long. I recall that during the first week of school, the teachers would excuse you if you were tardy due to the interurban. But since everybody caught on to that rather quickly, <laughs> That amnesty lasted only for the first week of school. <laughs> then you were held to know the interurban schedule so that you didn't get caught. We messed around in the lake a lot and in the marshes. Our home was on an alley, an east-west alley that ran through the 100 block of Fulton Street. Right across the alley, Allen and Elmer Clemens, the great slot machine magnates of Ottawa County, <laughs> had their collection site and repair shop for slot machines. And these slot machines would come in great huge boxes. We were always the beneficiary of the boxes so that we had forts with trap doors and we built apartment houses and numerous things. My brother was much better at building than I was. Uh, you'd have thought that we ourselves were in the construction business, all the houses, forts, fortifications that we built. And like I said, my brother was good he built little boats, and we messed around in the marsh a lot. We swam at the yacht club. We had to walk out through a quarter mile of marsh to get to clear water, but it was a good life. My mother, as a little girl, went to New York to visit her sister, Auntie Clem, Clementine Heinemann Nessel. Auntie Clem carved out a brilliant career in New York City, played with Paul Whiteman, played with Eddie Duchin, also wrote the Port Clinton High School fight song. Annie Clem would take her younger sister to the speakeasies in Greenwich Village, and every time these spe speakeasy operators learned that mom was from Port Clinton, they'd say, oh, you're from Port Clinton. We get all our stuff from Port Clinton. <laughs> Mother also tells the story that one time during high school, she and a group of her friends had an all-night beach party and they had a large bonfire going on the beach. During the course of the evening, they noticed lights maneuvering further down the beach. So they got curious and went down. And there were some bootleggers that had come ashore with one of their false bottom speedboats, and they were unloading cases of whiskey that they brought from Canada. They enlisted the help of the high school kids to unload, and kids being innovative, they would take two cases to the truck and one into the woods. <laughs> so that after the boot bootleggers left, the party got very interesting. <laughs> I'll tell you something about my mother growing up in Port Clinton. Every year, the Manelli Brothers Circus would come to Port Clinton, a traveling tent show, horse-drawn wagons, <laughs> the whole thing. And the Man Manellis would always stay with Grandpa Heinemann. Now, they had a little boy in the Manelli family, and his name was Vincenzo. 
He was my mother's age, and they always played together and were really good friends. They always, I was told, looked forward to every summer coming back to Port Clinton so that they could get together and play. Of course, that's Vincent Minnelli, Judy Garland's husband. And thus, always are good times on the North Shore. <laughs> I was born in Mexico. I am the oldest of 12 brothers and sisters, seven sisters and five brothers. I did not go to school or nothing, but I did go to school after I got married, when I, when I married Frank. I went to adult education because I have to know, because I want to become an American citizen. And I have to know about the history of the United States, Washington, and all exciting. I like that. I go to school here and school there. I stop a couple, mm, oh, about four years ago. Always I have school and learn, and always I learn something, and then I stop there because I think I learn enough. <laughs> when I marry him, I was Spanish, and he was Puerto Rican. <laughs> nice mess, huh? <laughs> nice mixture for my kids, because they are Spanish and Puerto Rican. So, we have four boys and one girl. And, ah, I love to raise my kids. I love kids. <laughs> I, I come from seven kids, and I marry, and then in 1957, I had first child, Dan. He is the oldest. And then I had second, and then I have Jim, and I have David, and I have Frank. So, I stay home making babies, raising babies, taking care of my babies. When my oldest was older, he's still 15 and a half. We lie. We want him to find a job. So, I used to work in Anchor Point Marino in Reno Beach, and they paid me good, you know, pay in that time, good. And in the 70s, he start working there after school, Saturdays and Sundays, and I worked there. But then he got a different job, and I go to store in the mall, Grinnell's Music Store. See, I like to improve all the time. I like to do something. I like my job, but I, I would like to be dressed up. High heels, hairdo, mini skirts, and such. <laughs> I like it for a while, but then oh, air condition, always cold. <laughs> <laughs> so then they cut the time, the hours, from 40 to 22, and this is not enough. Uh, he works in slaughterhouse, and I have to help. He paid. We buy groceries only every two weeks because we have payment on this house, and uh, not this house. We have an old house with nothing inside. But we're really happy. Well, my kids, I raise my kids, you know, and then I don't have nothing to say about my kids. <coughs> you know, they, they grow up. They fly out of the nest and then they leave us and we, we, we try to teach them the best the best religion, I mean manners, schooling, religion, and, and then they fly. And it's their decision what they do. They, they do whatever, there's nothing I can do. I got upset with one, but then I think it's not my business. You can do which religion because you know, I'm a Catholic. And I'm going to die Catholic. You know, everybody talks about Catholics, but <laughs> Catholics talk about others, too, you know. <laughs> when my four boys and my girl, my daughter, oh, my daughter, she is daddy's girl, always, always. But my boys, I speak for my boys. But in 1975, Frank says, Ohio, Ottawa County was pretty fair. It was fair, and it was nice, but, but we lose one child there at, at 19 years old. 
1978, we spend a blizzard year in 1978 together. We talk a lot in the winter. We talk about friendship, about family, and we talk about death. We wake up talking about death. My son got the chills and he says, Mom, if I ever die, cover me with a blanket. He died in 1978, June 11th. I cover him with a blanket. It was really hard, real hard. I go on now, like at home. I don't do nothing. So, from Grinnell Brothers Music Store, I jump in another job part-time. I work for Grinnell's, and I work for Lakewood Greenhouse. But I don't like this shop, Grinnell's. I like better the greenhouse. Flowers deal with soil. You water them and all that. In 1973, I start full-time in Lakewood Greenhouse. I am 67 years old, and I am retired, but I, I work full time. I carry my insurance, I carry my retirement. The, the company pays so much, and I pay so much, and they grow up, you know. When I decide to quit, I will get money, because it's not penalty, and so I plan to work until I can. I get tired, but I am pretty good. And then I feel stronger. I like my job because I'm a designer. I go to school 13 weeks here, 13 weeks there, and, and go here, go there, learning how to deal with flowers, how to plant. And I know a lot about agriculture. And then to know I love my job because I'm on my own. I make decisions. I make productions for sales for all Kroger stores, all whole state of Ohio and up into Indiana, where they go in Indiana. To, pretty good, huh? And like I said, school here, school there, but I like to progress and I'd like to do something all the time. I became a citizen in 1973. I've still got the newspaper between 72 and 73. I was already working full time for Lakewood Greenhouse on Lemoyne Road. I've been there a long time now, all my good years. But I enjoy it. I learn different things every day. Every day. <laughs> How is our time going? My watch is dying. It's after three. In that case, I'm afraid we had better call an end to this meeting. I very much appreciate our good, good readers who have brought a tear. <laughs> <laughs> we will have a short business meeting. Anyone who would like to stay is most welcome, and I thank you all for coming. Sally, Sally, can you give me two minutes? Sure, Wilbur. You want to? No, okay, you can hear me from that. But, uh, you know, next to our farm was a 40-acre farm, and it was owned by what we called uh, Mady Block. Now, she lived in uh, maybe Danbury Township, a lot of people here from uh, Catawba Island. Uh, I'm talking about the 1920s now. I was born in 1915. But, uh, she owned this farm next to us, and uh, every once in a while, uh, well, she would rent the farm out, and every once in a while, the house would be empty. So, Mady would come, uh, she'd come on the inner urban, and she'd walk a half mile this way and a half mile that way, and she would beat her a farm. But she went by our home, and uh, she had a double barrel shotgun. <laughs> and, uh, but she'd go by our home, when she's going, she'd pick the gun up, go to her home, stay a couple days, 
On her way back, she would stop at our house and leave her gun on the shelves at our house. And, uh, and that's the way it went for a number of years. Now, I think she lived with uh, people by the name of Gilkin. Gilkin? Uh, anybody? Uh, Gilkin. Gilkin. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Gilkin. 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 Her name, we called her May Block. Yeah. Maybe yes. it was Block. Mm -hmm. Block. But um, it was kind of interesting. And she was uh, quite a lady. Okay. I just wanted to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, gay shot.